Father, tonight we ask you that the eyes of our understanding is open to the realities of your kingdom. Thank you, Father, because we receive your word with thankfulness in our hearts. And tonight we ask you that our heart opens to the reality of your kingdom and we walk in the glory of the man in Christ to the honor of your name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The work of God is going on in your life. Now, in our previous lesson, um, we established that one incontrovertible fact of the life in Christ is that we are, we are sons of God. And then we took an example, we examined the life of Christ as son of God, being the firstborn of our type, whose coming was prophesied in scripture by several prophets at different times, validated by several miracles, signs, and wonders, beginning with his supernatural conception. Divine confirmation at his baptism by a reputable prophet. And furthermore, he went out performing several miracles, healing, the, healing sick folks, casting out devils, raising the dead, and so on and so forth. And the ultimate of them all is resurrection from the dead. Yet, Jesus was not accepted by his own family. In spite of all these things, he was not accepted by his own family. His king's men rejected him, and his own nation condemned him to death. Despite all the great things written about him, which he, even, which he actually fulfilled. Okay? Uh, but in all of this, in spite of all the opposition that Jesus experienced, he arrived at his place of glory, the very right hand of the Father. Now, so, I took you through all of that to tell you that in spite of all the opposition, all the persecution, and all the op- things that Jesus faced in his time, you see, he did not stop the work of God from proceeding in his life. And eventually, he got to that place of glory that God reserved for him. Uh, and I, I said all of that to tell you that it does not matter also what was going on in your life or around you. The work of God is going on in your life. And that is because you are a child of God. Do you follow now? Now, so tonight, I want to take it further so we had to that lesson. Now, another incontrovert- incontrovertible fact of the life in Christ is that we are loved. Loved by God. We are loved and loved by God. And we are loved with a kind of love that we do not earn. And we will never be able to pay for. Yet, we would never be separate from. Do you follow now? We are loved by God. We are loved. We are loved by God. And then... We are loved with a love that we did not earn and that we will never be able to pay for. You see that now? And yet, nothing will ever separate us from that love. This is the reality of the life of the man in Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Look at it. It says, behold, what manner of love? What manner of love is this love wherewith the Father has loved us with? To the point that he looked on us, formed out of clay. Well, from the dust, you understand what I mean? From the dust of the earth, we as human beings were formed out of the dust of the earth, yet the Father considered us to invest his love on us. Remember in our previous, just our last lesson, I told you that God's value system, the way God, you know, um, value things, 
differs from the way we human beings value things. And, you know, of course, there are some of us, you know, who, 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 you know, there are some things that we value like that too. For instance, how many of you have seen a bidding system? Ever? You have seen a bidding system. You want to, you, there, there are items up for sale, but it is not at a fair market value. So you don't just, the, the seller has not fixed a, maybe the, because in bidding system, they always fix the minimum price. Okay? There is a minimum price attached to a good, like this turn now. There is a price attached to it. Everything has a price. So there is a minimum price and they put it down. But then they say to you, if you are going to take this asset home, you have to bid for it. And whoever values it the most is the one who gets it. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. The one who values it the most. And now, how do we know that you are the one that values it the most? You will be the one who puts the highest price on it. That's simply what bidding means. So, if you want to get that item, you have to bid the highest for it. Now, so, whoever places value on it the most is the one who places the highest value highest amount of money on it and you are the one who will now take the asset home so if you have an artwork for instance someone looks at it and say what rubbish another person comes and says oh wow this is a masterpiece this is a masterpiece i want this you see that now so you see that your value system is different from that person because the person is able to say hmm this is a masterpiece and then and the person collects that heart, pay a high value price for it at this point, but hoping that in the future, he probably sell, sells it on for a higher value. So, so if, you, if you think of it like this, the same way, in God valuing us, God did not consider, you know, that we were made out of dust. He invested his love on us. And how do we know that God loved us so much? You remember in the lesson, we talked about him giving the life of his son to redeem us from the, from the hold of sin. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay, so now, let's continue from there. Now, so how do we know that God loves us? The price he was willing to pay. So the Bible says, what kind of love is this one? That the father has lavished on us that we should be called his son. This is a great love that the Father has lavished on us. It is strange. So he says, what kind of love is this? What kind of love is this? That we should be called the sons of God. But that is the love of the Father. That is the love of the Father. That is how the Father values us. You see, the price he's willing to pay is a demonstration of the, mo the, the love he has for us. In 1 John, the same 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him, hearing his love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Look at it. He says, this is how the love of God manifested toward us. How did we see the love of God? He sent his son into the world for us. That we might have life through him. And how would we have life through him? He took our sins away. Look at it. It is not that we loved God. But he loved us. And then he gave his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So, if sin is going to be an impediment between God and us, God took on himself the, the, the responsibility of removing that sin away from us so that sin would not be an impediment to our relationship. And now, the only reason he would do that is because he loved us or he loves us. Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Are you still here with me? So, just like in the last lesson, which we also looked at similar, similar scriptures to this, to determine how much value God places on us, you are seeing this in the same light. That the, the demonstration of the love of God toward us is in what price he is willing to pay for our redemption. Or he was willing to pay for our redemption. Which was the life of his own son. You see. So that's why I called it an incontrovertible fact of our life in Christ. Is that we are loved. We are loved by God. We are loved. And the Bible says, what manner of love is this? What kind of love is this one? That God would love us to the point of giving his son up for us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, the Bible says, What shall we then say to these things? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Look at it. What shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things? He says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Why is God for us? Because he loved us. He loved us. And he proved it by not sparing his son. He loved us. And demonstrated that love. Now, this is not lip service. This is not high service. You know, have you ever served someone with lip service? What about eye service? You see, it's just like it's just like a wife who does all that she does for her husband just so that she can be in his good books. And, if, and vice versa. You know, husband that is just doing the minimum just to keep just, just to keep going. Or an employer to an employee. The employ, em, employee who does the bare minimum to be in the good books of his boss or a boss. You see, that kind of activity that you do to win, just enough to win the approval of someone is high service. Because you are doing it to win the person's approval. Not doing it because it is a duty. Not because you hold the person that responsibility. To do it. You see that now. Alright, but look at it. God in, in fact, in our own case with God, there was nothing that we deserve. And there was no way in which we benefited him. In fact, we were just, you know, we were everything against his will. But in that state of squalor, he was still willing to pay the highest price that is available for our redemption. So the Bible says, God commended his love toward us. In that we were sinners, yet he died for us. You see, he died for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 to 7, the Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Look at it. He says, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, you see that now. Why did he lavish his mercy on us? Because he loved us so much. Now, I, I'm not... You see, 
Jesus talked about it in John chapter 3, verse 16. That he says, For God so loved the world. You see. So, God, one thing you see that you see in Christ that you don't so much see, not that it is not there, but it is not pronounced be, the way Jesus and the apostles taught it is the love of God. So, in the, so, for instance, you look at the Old Testament, it feels like God is very stern and very vehement and very um, brutal, very judgmental in the Old Testament. No, it, it was because of what, the way they related with God. But, you know, when Jesus came, he started showing us God. He says, God is very loving. God is very kind. And in fact, the reason he came into the world was because God loves us so much that he does not even want us to pay the price for our own sin. Do you understand this? Like, okay, if you, if you have done something wrong, it is only fair. It serves the cause of justice that you pay the just recompense of your own actions. That's justice. And do you know, look, have you ever thought of it like this? That, you know, justice, the sense of justice, generally, is to make someone that has been deprived of fairness, is to give that person that has been deprived that sense of fairness um, uh, some sort of closure. Okay? So, somebody stole your item. Okay? Now, you found out that this is the particular person that stole the item. Now, how do you feel some, some, some sort of reprieve? Or how do you feel um, reprieved, you see, from that pain of being deprived of your beloved assets? Now, to some people, if that person is arrested and publicly shamed or imprisoned or executed, oh, they feel like, that's it. But there are some people, they just want their item back. Just give me my stuff back. You have been caught. Give me my stuff back. I don't care what happens to you. Just give me my stuff back. But there are some other people, they have other ways of feeling. Some people, they steal another person's item. Like, ah, you steal my own, I steal another person. You know? Like, you know, that's where that expression, do me, I do you. God, no vex. You know, even though it's very devilish thinking, you know, you say, do me, I do you. God, no vex. Now, you know, that is a very sinful thing to say. To say, you do me, I do you. You now say, you now bring God, you, if you say, do me, I do you, and you leave it there, no problem. But you now say, do me, I do you. God, no vex. No, God vex. God, they vex. Why will he not vex? Because you are directly contradicting his word. The Bible says God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. You now say, you do me, I do you back. Jesus thought, you, you are slapped on one cheek, turn the other one. You say, no, you slap me one, I slap you two times. Pa, pa. You know? He, 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 no, that's not God. You know, God is not willing to exact the appropriate recompense for justice from you. Because if you were to do that, the Bible says if God marks iniquity, who shall stand? Meaning that nobody, nobody will be saved. But God is not willing to do that. So the Bible says because of that great mercy. So now, that unwillingness of God to judge us, to pay us the just recompense for our sin, is what the Bible calls his mercy. That, oh, I don't want these people to suffer like this. No, I don't want them to suffer like this. So, I will take on myself the punishment of their iniquity. So, the Bible calls it the great mercy of God. That, because of that great mercy, he says, that richness of God in mercy, because of the love he has for us. So, that mercy is not, is not something that God just invested on us out of thin, you, you know, out of just thin air. No. It is a function of the love that he has for his, creat his creatures. Are you following what I'm saying? So because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead 
useless, paralyzed, held down by sin. No life. Because we are dead in sin. He says, yet he quickened us together with Christ. So, that's why in bracket in KJV, you are using KJV like me. He says, by grace you are saved. Meaning that, you see, this, and if you continue to read the passage, it is the sense it gives you. That you are, you are saved not because of yourself. You are saved because of God. God lavished his mercy on you because he loves you. And, you know, the love of God is not just, is not unique to Christians. Yes, he loves us because we are his sons and we are in that special relationship with him. But God's love is open to all, including the entire world. So, he saved us by grace and has raised us up. You know, remember he says dead in sin. Then he says quickened us together with Christ. So, he raised us up together with Christ and made us to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So not only does, did he raise us from the dead, death to sin, he also sat us, raised us up to life and sat us with Christ in the place of his glory and power because of his love. Because of his love. Hallelujah. Now let's go on. So this extent of love is the rocky foundation on which our opinion of God must be built. Are you following what I'm saying? The, this extent of love is the rocky foundation on which our opinion of God must be built. And this will now help you make sense of the prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, or an ex, by extension, the entire church world. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, 17 to 19, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you see that now? He says, I want you to know the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ. The love that Christ has for us. And that, 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 that love, you see it in that Romans chapter 5 we read earlier. The Bible says that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So the Bible says, you know, Paul prayed for us that we will comprehend that love of Jesus Christ. And how did Christ demonstrate that love for us? He died for us. So he wants us to comprehend that love. You know, is it for fun that somebody dies for you? If somebody dies for you, you think it's for fun? You know, for instance, if you look at the idea of secret service, you know, which most countries copied from America, you know, um, that protects the president. Um, like in our country, we have a version of it. Um, they protect the president. The idea in the U.S., for instance, where it comes from originally, is that if you are in that secret, if you are a secret service detail of the president, you must be ready to take a bullet for the president. So, if somebody shoots at the president, you must be able to, if somebody is going to kill the president, you must be able to stand in front of him and be a barrier between the killer and the president. That's the idea of being the protector of the president. You stand between anyone that is going to kill him. You see? And there are so many around him. So you see several men, some in front, some on the side, some, in, some behind him. So if somebody shoots from the front, somebody must be willing to take the bullet. Somebody shoots from the back, somebody must be willing to take the bullet. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, do you think it is a joke that somebody is put to that kind of job? The person must have been prepped, you know, for that kind of role. Like, are you sure you want to do this? If the president ever comes in harm's way, you must do whatever it takes to protect him. That is your job. Now, imagine that God now considers, like, ah, if these people, God has been sending prophets, 
prophets after prophets. Go to these people and tell them that they, I don't want them to perish in their sin. Show them how to live properly, how not to walk in sin, how to live under the love of God, how to live in the will of God. They, and the prophets came and they taught, by the, and they wrote all the things they taught them in the scriptures that we have as evidence today. And upon all the teachings, people still failed. They could not uphold the righteousness of God. They could not live up to God's standard. You see that now? But in the plan of God, in the plan of God, God had determined that he would do it by himself. If all fails, he will do it by himself. And he did it by himself. And that is what we see that Christ demonstrates uh, for us. So you have to understand that the love of God is a critical, critical reality for the man in Christ. It is a reality that is it's a foundational reality of living the life of the man in Christ. So when your heart is assured in the love of God, that, and that's the reason I took you through all these Bible passages in the love of God. If your heart is assured, when your heart is assured in the love of God, you will not have misgivings about the disposition of God toward you, regardless of what the world throws at you. Hmm. You will consider God faithful to the declaration of his love for you, which he demonstrated with the highest level of sacrifice to prove as we have seen in all the passages that we have read. You see that now? So, your primary responsibility as a believer is to understand the love of God and be assured in it. You are convinced about the love of God that God loves you so much and you have come to that place of certainty that you don't doubt that God loves you. And the way to do that is to look at the evidence. Did God demonstrate his love for you? Did he do that? How did he demonstrate his love for you? He paid a price for you. To show you that he loves you. And we have gone through all of that. So you have to look at the evidence. And then you must come to that conclusion. That regardless of what happens in this world. Regardless of what you experience. What your experiences have been. Or would be. You must never be shaken in your resolve that God loves you. So the question is, what is you, what, in what state are you right now in your work with God? What is, what is your experience like at the moment? And by your human, human consideration, does it reflect the love of God? Now, if you say, no, that means you are yet to have a grasp of the, of the love of God. You don't have a grasp of the, of the love of God. Because if you do, regardless of what your experiences are, you will not have any misgivings about the love of God. So you have to come to that place of assurance. And that was the importance of the prayer of Paul. He says that you may know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. To understand it. To have an experiential you know, knowledge of the love of God. And, you know, the exp you, know, exp you know, in this world, you know, people relate more with experiences than they relate with the reality and the simplicity of the word of God. Like, what I just described to you, in painting the love of God. Now, there is no bigger and better example to communicate the love of God than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, do you know that it will be easier for you, maybe not for you, because you are well taught. Now, it will be easier for and you are still being taught 
and you will continually be taught. Now, but for the, for the most part, people are able to relate with you telling a story of how you were in some deprived state and then in, you know, you prayed and God came through and then removed the problem and then you declare off of the fact that God removed the problem that God loves you. I don't know if you follow what I'm saying. So if I tell you now that, ah, I was suffering. I was suffering. Oh God, I suffered in this life. I suffered. My eyes, uh, what my eyes saw, my mouth cannot describe. What my, what my eyes saw, my mouth cannot describe. In this life, I suffered. From when I was born. Oh, my, mom, my parents did not have money. I suffered. In fact, many times, you know, I did not wear shoes until I was 15. Until I was 17. That was how somebody came to become president in this country. Sympathy. You know? And, and, then, and then you say, ah, when I was growing up, I, I used to buy thrift clothes. I used to do this. Oh God, I suffered. I suffered. Ah, but when I came to know Jesus, and I came to know him, oh, he changed my story. He changed my story. Oh, now, I am living life full of glory. You know? And I know that God loves me. Now, that is okay. That is okay. There is nothing wrong with that. But the perfect example of God's love for you is not that experience. Because there is a bigger thing God has done to show that he loves you. And you cannot sacrifice on the altar of convenience the highest demonstration of the love of God. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. You cannot sacrifice on the altar of convenience. The highest demonstration of the love of God, which is the sacrifice of his only son, Jesus Christ. So you will consider God faithful to the declaration of his love for you, which he demonstrated with the highest level of sacrifice to prove it. So I say to you, one, when things are quiet and it seems God is not hearing you, let alone answer, answering you, still you judge God faithful. Now, that is how you know you have come to that place of assurance about God's love. When things are quiet and seems that God is not hearing, let alone answering you, you still judge God faithful. Number two, when the world works against you, every element thereof not working in your favor or to your advantage, you judge God yet faithful. Number two, I say it again, when the world works against you, every element thereof not working in your favor, or to your advantage, you judge God yet faithful. When people treat you like the scum of the earth, number three, when people, judge, when people treat you like the scum of the earth, treat you unfairly, rejected by men, on every turn, you account God loving and faithful still. I'll take number three again. When people treat you like scum of the earth, Treat you unfairly, rejected by men on every turn, you account God loving and faithful still. Number four, when you have poor reward for your labors, doing much with little to show for it, doing all that you can to progress, but result shows failure. You account God yet faithful. I'll take number four again. When you have poor reward for your labors, doing much with little to show for it, doing all you can to progress, but result shows failure, you account God yet faithful. Now, you can think of your own and hard to them. No matter what negative experience you have, it does not in any way invalidate the love of God. That's what I'm saying. 
So, on the account of convenience, right, you cannot invalidate a reality in Christ Jesus. That God loves you is sacrosanct. That God loves you is, a, is an incontrovertible fact in this life. In this Christian life. No, it is an incontrovertible fact. You cannot fight it. What you rather do is to learn it and embrace it. And don't let your experiences determine how or what your perception is about the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And there is nothing more for God to do to prove to you that he loves you so dearly that can be greater than the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ. Should I say that again? There is nothing more for God to do to prove to you that he loves you so dearly that can be greater than the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ. And that's what we found in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see that now? So, don't ever sacrifice the reality of Christ, a reality in Christ, on the altar of convenience. Oh, eh, if God loves me, why can't this be this? If God loves me, why can't it be that? If God loves me, why are things not working? If God loves me, why is my, my, why is my life like this? No, 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 no. The love of God is the love of God. And he has demonstrated it in, to the highest possible regard that is available, which is the life of his son. So you should not sac sacrifice a reality in Christ, such as the love of God that we have just considered, on the altar of life's difficult experiences. Okay? So no matter what difficult experiences you are going through, let it not determine, you know, your disposition toward your, your, uh, towards, towards the love of God. Okay? And maybe I should read you uh, one or two examples so that you can see that. Let me read you one or two examples so that you can see that. In Revelations chapter, uh, in Revelations chapter, look at chapter 1. I just read on my face. All right, look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I am going to read to you uh, from verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the head, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6. And at, look at it, made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look at it. In verse 5, he says, Unto him that loved us. But now, this man, John, that wrote this book, who is preaching the love of God to us now? He's telling us about how much Christ loved us. And the sacrifice, he, 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 you know, the extent of you know, his commitment to us, which we see in the sacrifice of his own life for us, was a man that was imprisoned. In fact, he was imprisoned because of his association with Jesus. Look at it in verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Can you see? So he was imprisoned in this island called Patmos. For the testimony of Jesus because he was a preacher of the gospel because of the work of the ministry that he did he was arrested and imprisoned but look at this same man 
Look at it. He started preaching the love of God to the people. So, he's writing to these people and the first thing he's declaring to them is that, look, Jesus Christ loves us. And he demonstrated it by washing us from our sins in his own blood. And if you read from, if you read from Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 12. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Look at this. Now, the reason I read you this is to show you how much affliction, persecution, pain that Paul went through to minister the gospel in the regions of Asia Minor. Now, in this particular instance, he had just suffered by the time he came to Galicia. He was beaten to pulp. You see that story in Acts of Apostles that they left him for the dead. And after that experience, he went to Galicia to preach the gospel. To show them the love of God. Now, you would think that it is rational for people to ask him, if your God loves you this much, why did he allow them to beat you up like this? And suffer this much. Do you see that there is this disconnect the apostles were deliberate about? Their physical reality, they have disconnected their physical reality from their life in Christ. That whether we live or die, right? They consider their life to the glory of God. So, whatever their experiences were, had no impact on their understanding of the love of God. So they were able to separate the love of God for them from whatever they were going through. And in fact, they were willing to go through those experiences to reciprocate the love of God. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So if we will close with Romans chapter, chapter 8. Let's go there. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read from verse um, I think 39. Uh, we are going to read to 39, but let's start from um, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay any charge, anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from... Now, when he, when he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, don't look at it from your own perspective. That who can draw you you away from the love of Christ. Mm -mm. Look at it from the perspective of Jesus. Who is the one that invested his love on you? Jesus. Now, so, who can separate you from that love? So, look at, don't look at it from your own perspective like, oh, I have resolved in my heart that nothing can separate me from the love of God. As if there is something you can do to keep yourself in the love of God. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Now, so read it the other way around. That... It is God holding tightly to you because of his love. Now, who can now separate you from God? That is, who can snatch you away from God's love? Are, are you following? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at it. He says, what can separate us? Tribulation, 
tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, naked, nakedness, peril or sword. For thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all those things we are more than conqueror. Through him that loved us. Notice he didn't say through our love for him. I, I hope you follow what I'm saying. Through him that loved us. So the reason we are more than conqueror is what? Because he loves us. So it is always about the love of Jesus. So now, look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, where is the love of God found? In Christ. So he says, now that we are in Christ, there is nothing that is capable to snatch us away from that love. Hallelujah. And look at all the things he listed. Earthly things. Even heavenly things. Because he mentioned angels and principalities and powers. He said, oh, life or death. He says, none of these things can separate us from what we have in Christ Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? So what kind of experiences can you have in this life that shakes your, your, your understanding of the love of God? So resolve in your mind that God loves you. Resolve it. Don't, don't, let your, don't be driven by your experiences. Don't be driven by experiences. Rather, recondition your mind so that your experiences can bow to the knowledge of God that you have ingrained in you. Hallelujah. Father, tonight we ask you that our life will experience your love. We will have our experiences will yield to your love to the honor of your majesty and we walk in the reality of your kingdom. We will experience the love of the Father and we will demonstrate the same to others around us to the glory of your name in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Say amen.